Hello, everyone. So today's topic is about a specific objection to Pascal's wager that has to do with the afterlife and specifically has to do with hell. So let's just very briefly review the question, what is Pascal's wager? I have several other videos going into more detail, but I'm just going to kind of briefly summarize here. Pascal's wager is an argument that you ought to believe in God or you should believe in God. And it basically goes like this. Um, look, if you believe in God and God exists, things will be infinitely good. Um, you get to have a relationship with God. You get to go to heaven, which is infinitely good. Uh, if you don't believe in God and God exists, then things are infinitely bad, especially if you go to hell. And if God doesn't exist, then whether you believe in God or not, either way is finite. So we can debate about the kind of different costs and benefits there might be there, but either way is finite. And when we do this thing in decision theory, which, me, which is called calculating the expected value, basically the value of something given our position of uncertainty, sort of given this cost benefit analysis, it looks like believing in God is significantly better than not believing in God, and in fact, infinitely better than not believing in God. Um, so note that n and 1 minus n are probabilities, and the only reason it says 1 minus n is just to indicate that those two probabilities add up to 1. Um, and like I said, expected value indicates um, the value of each of these actions, given that we're uncertain about God's existence. So we can use expected value reasoning in a lot of different situations, whether it's something mundane, like whether I should bring an umbrella with me um, to tomorrow, given like some chance of rain or really serious questions, like whether I should commit to God. Okay. Um, and then finally, as long as the probability that God exists is greater than zero, and then supposing this idea that we should maximize expected value, which is a widely accepted principle in decision theory, then we should believe in God. So, um, you know, as long as we don't say that there's a probability of zero that God exists, uh, it seems like the prudential thing to do sort of given this setup is believing in God. So that's basically what Pascal's wager is. Um, now let's shift gears a little bit. So when we were talking about Pascal's wager, maybe I'll go back really quick, especially these two numbers, there's different ways you can argue for these values, right? There's different reasons you might put these values here. So that's one thing to just note, first of all, that this objection is only going to apply to specific reasons that you would have these values. But one of the big reasons for these values has to do with the nature of the afterlife. So what we want to do is address an objection to Pascal's wager that has to do with these values um, that involves the nature of the afterlife. So I'm going to briefly give a, a basic background of the three main views of the afterlife. The first is universalism. Universalism is the view that everyone goes to heaven. Um, the second is annihilationism, which is the view that while some people go to heaven, other people are annihilated, which means they cease to exist after their biological death. And then finally, there's a view that involves hell. Hell um, is this, what I mean by this is it's the doctrine that some people go to a place of eternal conscious torment after death. Um, so, you know, it's interesting that, you know, on all these views, some on all the views, at least the dominant views, the idea is that some people go to heaven, right? Um, and then there's debates about whether that's everyone. And then for the people that don't, whether some of those people are annihilated um, or some of those people go to hell. Um, and note, you could even have a view where some people go to heaven, some people are annihilated, and other people go to hell, right? Um, you might also have a view where people go to some uh, not blissful place. So it's not heaven, like some kind of purgatory, but then eventually end up in heaven. For our purposes, we're just going to count them as going to heaven because that's where they eventually end up. You could also have a view where people cease to exist for some finite period after biological death and then they're annihilated. That would be a version of annihilationism. So you can kind of fit most of the dominant views into, into something like this framework. Um, the reason I put the number line here is one way to think about 
um, universalism or heaven, annihilationism and hell is with this number line. You can think of heaven as being sort of in the positive range. If you're in heaven, the afterlife for you is in the positive range. If you're in hell, the afterlife for you is in the negative range. And then if you're annihilated, it's basically at zero. Okay, so those are sort of three, three main views of the afterlife. This brings us to the objection that I want to address in this video, an objection to Pascal's wager. And first I want to note, there's a ton of objections to Pascal's wager. People love bringing up the many gods objection. It's a lot of people, especially on YouTube, it's their favorite objection. I've addressed that extensively, uh, both in other videos, also in my work. So you can check out my paper called Salvaging Pascal's Wager, where my co-author and I uh, we spend, you know, more than the first half of the paper extensively addressing that objection. So caveat, there's lots of objections I'm not addressing here, but I have addressed in other work. So go check out my papers and other videos if you're interested. Okay, here I want to focus on a very specific objection that has to do with hell. The objection goes like this. Since God is all good and God is all loving, God wouldn't send people to hell. That's just not something an all good or all loving God would do. Um, because of this, there's no point in taking Pascal's wager because this risk of going to hell is taken out. Or at the very least, um, you might say, well, we'll have to significantly modify the wager. It's going to look really different than it was presented um, on that first slide. I think it was actually the second slide, but you get the idea. Um, and you can almost just put this as a question. Like if I don't believe in hell, why would I take Pascal's wager? And I think a lot of people do have this intuition that a loving God wouldn't send people to hell. And then if you kind of encounter Pascal's wager, you might say, well, I don't believe in hell. So what's the point of wagering? Like, why would I wager at all? Okay. This kind of brings up the question, would a loving God send people to hell? And I think the first thing to say here is this is a subject of a lot of debate. Um, this is a matter where religious philosophers do adamantly disagree among philosophers of religion. Um, I know people that have all three positions, universalism, annihilationism, or the more traditional view of hell. So there's a lot of discussion and debate of this. And I will note that some people have presented arguments that an infinite hell could be just even though that might seem counterintuitive initially. Um, but here's just two quick examples of this. So Oliver Crisp argues that God is an infinite being. And because God is infinitely great, sin against God is infinitely bad. So the idea behind this is that how bad it is to wrong someone depends on the being you're wronging. It's worse to wrong a human than it is to wrong a plant. Um, you know, it's, it's worse to wrong a human than it is to wrong an animal, maybe, right? And so how bad the thing you're doing, if you're wronging someone or something else, it depends on the status of that thing you're wronging. And so the idea is that because God is infinite, when we sin against God, that's infinitely bad. And that's why hell is infinite and deserves an infinite punishment. Again, I'm not endorsing this argument. I'm not saying there aren't ways you could object to it, but it's just to give you an idea of some of the reasons that people do defend hell. Um, C.S. Lewis and Michael Murray suggest something that's kind of different. And the idea is that people in hell, they continue to sin. And so we're actually not getting an infinite sin for a finite punishment um, because they continue to sin in hell you're actually getting a infinite punishment for an infinite sin because you're also punished for the sins that are committed in hell. Okay, again, this is a very brief overview. I'm not here to totally and extensively defend these positions, but it's just to give you an idea of some of the reasons that people defend the idea that hell might be just. Okay, let's say you're not convinced. Let's say for whatever reason you say these arguments that hell could be just, they suck. <laughs> Um, if you're not convinced of these arguments and you think they're bad arguments, is there any reason for you to take Pascal's wager? The answer is yes, actually. Um, so here's the first reason. You might believe that there is no hell. You might say, I'm not convinced of these arguments. I still think a loving God would not send people to hell. And these are, these are not satisfactory arguments. Um, but even believing there's no hell, 
that still doesn't tell us if, if you're a hundred percent sure that there's no hell. There's lots of things we believe that we're not a hundred percent sure of. I believe my car is parked in front of my house. I'm not a hundred percent sure someone could have moved it or it could have been stolen. Right. Um, I believe that my leftover coffee is in the fridge, but you know, my husband could have dumped it out. So there's lots of things that we believe we're not a hundred percent sure of. So even if you're 99.999% sure there's no hell, as long as you're not 100% sure, you still have a reason to take Pascal's wager. And that's because there is this small chance that you're wrong about hell. There's a small chance that some of the defenses of hell given by these um, philosophers are successful. And because hell is infinitely bad and because heaven is infinitely good, even this small chance of there being a hell still gives you a reason to take Pascal's wager. So as long as you haven't totally ruled it out, um, you still might rationally take Pascal's wager. And note that many epistemologists think you shouldn't be 100% sure of anything. And that's because we can call almost anything into doubt. Um, if we can be 100% sure of things, it's, it's probably a very small number of things, things like I exist or one plus one equals two. But we learn from Descartes that almost everything can be brought into doubt. I have another video about skepticism that talks more about this. Um, but basically the idea is that, um, look, even the fact that like there's this table that I'm touching and um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing it, I'm sensing it. I, it's been here every day. And I remember it being here for, for over a year, right? Even despite that, I can't completely rule out the possibility that I'm in the matrix or I'm dreaming right now, or I'm a brain in a vat. Of course, those are very far-fetched, very unlikely possibilities, but I still cannot be a hundred percent sure that there's a table right here. Um, Descartes famously said, I think therefore I am, right? This is the one thing Descartes said we could be 100% sure of. But then, you know, Hume said, how do you know there's a you? How do you know there's a self? Maybe like there's a thought or there's a belief or there's a desire. That doesn't give you reason to conclude that you exist. So even the cogito, some people think can be brought into doubt. Um, so this is one reason that many epistemologists think you shouldn't actually be 100% sure of anything. But even if we can be 100% sure of certain things, um, it doesn't seem like a hotly debated question, like the question of whether there's a hell um, would be something that we could be 100% sure of. Okay, let's say though, you're still not convinced, right? Let's say you're like, look, I'm 100% sure that there's no hell. Maybe I just think it just conflicts with the goodness of God. And I'm as sure as that as I am that one plus one equals two and that I exist. Okay, then here's another question. Are you 100% sure that annihilationism is false? Annihilationism, again, is the view that some people cease to exist um, after death. So again, even if you're 99.999% sure that annihilation is false, you still have a reason to take Pascal's wager. And this is because going to heaven is infinitely better than being um, annihilated. So even someone very confident um, that annihilationism isn't the case and someone who completely rules out hell altogether could still have a reason to take Pascal's wager. So that's the second reason that those who don't believe in hell um, might still rationally take Pascal's wager. Okay, let's say you're still not convinced, right? So let's say you're in this position. I'm 100% sure there's no hell, and I'm 100% sure annihilationism is false. It's a pretty strong position, um, but let's just, let's just entertain it, right? Would you still, in this, in this case, have a reason to take Pascal's wager? And yes, you actually would if you think there's some chance that there are different levels of heaven. And again, the mere possibility of these different levels is all we need. So we don't need you to believe there are different levels of heaven or be confident. We just need this to be possible. So here's um, maybe a, a slightly crude example, but it will get the point across. So if there's level one gives you 10 utils of happiness per day for all eternity, and then level two gives you 12 utils of happiness per day for all eternity. Again, this is kind of just a toy example, but I think it'll get the point. Um, in some real and important sense, level two is 
infinitely better than level one. So they do have the same cardinality in the sense that they can be put into a one-to-one -one correspondence, but they're not ordinarily the same. And I think we just have this strong intuition. There's something infinitely better. You're getting two units of happiness per day for all eternity. Um, so level two is in that sense, infinitely better than level one. So, you know, if you think this thing is possible, then what you have reason to do is actually do the thing that maximizes your chance at getting into the highest level of heaven possible. So this would be a reason to take Pascal's wager, even if you are 100% sure there's no hell and you are 100% sure that annihilationism is false. So even if you are a utterly and completely convinced universalist, you still have a reason to take Pascal's wager. Okay. So what we've covered today, we've talked about what is Pascal's wager. We've talked about three views of the afterlife. We've discussed the hell objection to the wager uh, and two defenses of hell, how hell might be just. And then we finally covered three reasons you should take Pascal's wager, even if you aren't convinced by these defenses and you don't believe in hell. So here's some of the lessons that we learned. Lesson one, is that you don't have to believe in hell to rationally take Pascal's wager. As long as you think there's some possibility of hell, um, it's rational for you to take Pascal's wager. Lesson two is that even if you are 100% sure that hell doesn't exist, you might rationally take the wager in case, in case annihilationism is true. And then lesson three is that even if you're 100% sure both that hell doesn't exist and that annihilationism is, uh, is false, you might rationally take the wager in case there are different levels of heaven.